You really have to be patient and diligent and committed to establish a meditation practice. Because in the beginning, which is the hardest part, you can't shake off the thinking. This is why a lot of people who come to this class for one time and attempt to meditate, after they're done, the first thing they have to say is, this is not for me, because I don't want to sit there and watch my mind. I don't want to sit there and be told that I am to practice moving my attention away from thinking and be aware of the body breathing but find that I, as far as I could tell, the entire time I was just thinking about doing that. <laughs> and it was making me crazy to sit there and think about doing that, or it was making me crazy to sit there and feel the restlessness in my body. And the only thing that was happening is I would continue to have this thought, how much time has passed? When will it end? When will it be over? So we practice meditation the way we live life. When will it be over? When will the day be over? When will the weekend come? How long do I have to put up with this? And so meditation just becomes another thing to put up with. But you have to understand that in the beginning, that's inevitable because this is a habitual hypnotic state that you've been living your life in, in which you've been so completely identified <coughs> with the thinking activity, that if you're asked not to identify with it, if you're asked not to think, you go stupid. What do you mean, don't think? How could I not think? Now, that's the way it occurs for a lot of people, or worse, a lot of people say, oh no, not only was I thinking, but my mind was racing, and it was uncomfortable, and I don't know, maybe I didn't understand how to do this or whatever the case may be, but it didn't work. And you know, because we live in an Amazon world now, people try things to see if they like it. What's that got to do with what works? <laughs> you know, people try things to see if they like it. I tried it. How many times, those of you who've been coming to the class on a regular basis, how many times have somebody come into this class that was new Right? And that was the first and last time you saw them. Because that's the way it goes for most people. That's why, uh, that's why the class isn't bigger. That's why you, if you come here during the day and you look at some of these exercise classes, there's 50 people in there. They can't fit anybody else in the room, right? Because everybody knows that's good for you and it feels good and I like it and I like the instructor and I like the music and blah, blah, blah. And my doctor says it's good for me. <laughs> You know, but meditation's not like that. Meditation eliminates those who aren't ready. You know, somebody who attempts to practice meditation gets eliminated if they're not ripe, if they're not ready to do this. They'll get eliminated. Their mind will overpower the activity and have them avoid meditation, let alone practice meditation. So you really have to be able to stick it out. You really have to be able to see it through. It requires patience and diligence, and it requires an understanding that the mind's not going to give up. The mind's not going to just let you meditate. Oh, no. no. The mind doesn't want you not to be attending to your thinking. The mind doesn't want you not to be attending to your thinking because the programming that the mind is has it that your thinking is necessary for you to exist. Check it out. The way the mind's organized, it's organized in such a way that it has it that your thinking is necessary for you to exist. And in, in a sense, that's true, right? Because when you're thinking, right, who's thinking? See, when, when you're thinking, the, the thought process infers the personality, doesn't it? If you're thinking, I'm thinking. So if I'm thinking, it allows me to experience that I'm real because I'm thinking. I think, therefore, I am. It allows me to experience that I exist, that I'm real because I'm thinking not true, it's not true, and, and not only that, it's worse than that because the you that allows you to experience when you're thinking is neurotic. Please look up the definition of neurosis and read it, right? Because if you read it and you begin to understand that's you when you're thinking. Neurosis, the definition you read, what is neurotic behavior? Lots of people feel anxious from time to time. 
you might get a knot in your stomach before a job interview, stress about money, or fret if your child isn't home by curfew. It's a normal part of being human. But what if your extreme worry doesn't go away? Negative or obsessive thoughts can take over your mind to the point that it's hard for you to handle everyday situations. That's called neurotic behavior. Hard for you to handle everyday situations. You wake up into that reality. You wake up into an apprehensive experience in the morning, like, oh no, what, what do I have to dread today? What do I have to avoid today? Right, so even before you get out of the bed, even before you stand up from the bed, you're already suffering. Nothing's happened yet. And you're already suffering just thinking. You're already suffering just thinking about what's going to happen or thinking about what did happen or thinking about what you want to happen or thinking about what you don't want to happen or thinking about what you need to remember and do. And, you know, neuroticism is paranoid. In other words, paranoid, in other words, you're a neurotic person is always afraid. They're always afraid. They're, they're afraid of what did happen, they're afraid of what will happen, they're afraid of what is happening. And it's such a constant experience of fear that it goes unnoticed. You know, it goes unnoticed. Um, because it's so constant, anything that's constant, like your breath, goes unnoticed because it's constant, it's happening all the time. If you're afraid all the time and your body's in a contracted state all the time, right, you don't know it. You don't know it. That's one of the reasons why if you do take the challenge of establishing a meditation practice and you do do it consistently, no matter what you think, no matter how you feel, you do do it consistently every day and you do it the way it's meant to be done. You practice having a posture that works and then you allow yourself to understand that it's going to take some time to get this nervous system to calm down. Right? Your nervous system is active, active, it's active all the time. Even when you're sleeping, it's active. It's active all the time. Right? It's imbalanced. You know, one of the Zen masters used to say, the only thing we're doing when we're practicing these practices and teachings is getting our nervous system to calm down so it can come to a state of balance. The nervous system is in a state of imbalance, and the state of imbalance is that it's constantly activated in terms of the threat factor. It's constantly activated in terms of there being concern. It's constantly activated in terms of being ready to run or attack. The evidence is clear that that's the case because it doesn't take much for you to attack or run, does it? All somebody's got to do is look at you the wrong way and you're ready to run or attack, right? And it doesn't even have to be some, a situation where you're with another person. All you have to do is just think about something and you can run from it without it ever even happening. So this is neurosis. This is a, a, a mild state, a mild mental disorder that disrupts your life and causes you not to be able to relax and causes you not to be able to enjoy yourself and enjoy your life because it keeps, it keeps producing through the thinking activity and through the emotional states that get reactivated, right? They get reactivated. As you go through your day, things happen that stimulate past experiences and anything that happens that stimulates a past experience where there was uh, a threat or pain or suffering or conflict, anything that happens that reminds you of something like that that happened in the past, it starts to replay. Yeah. You start reliving what happened in the past, literally reliving, and people don't realize how comprehensive that reliving is. It's not only reliving the emotions that you had in the past, it's literally reliving the thought pattern that you had in the past as well. Right. So you will behave like a child and you will act like a child because that's coming from your memory. It's coming from your past experience. And most of the things that happened to most of us that were the most painful and disruptive right, and disturbing happened when we were children, when we, had, when we were vulnerable, when we were subject to the whims of the giants that we were living with. And don't forget, when you're a child, when you're a real small child, 
Adults are gods. Adults are gods. You're completely dependent on them for your survival, right? And you believe that they know the truth. Children believe that adults know, know the truth. They don't have any other resource to go to, especially your parents and your family, right? So if you come from a particularly crazy family, right, you've been indoctrinated to believe in craziness. You, you literally develop a crazy mind, right? And most of us, unfortunately, are, most human beings are neurotic or worse, especially now, you know, because people uh, can't handle the situations that they find themselves in, and so they're in a reactive state a lot of the time. You're reacting a lot of time. What's it mean? To react means you're reacting. You're, re, you're, you're acting again the same pattern that it occurred in the past. Reaction. A re, you're having a reaction. When you get upset, you go into a reaction. When you get upset, you start experiencing something that happened in the past, you start having the thoughts you had then, and you start behaving the same way you did then. And it's all mechanical and it's all automatic. And, and if you identify with that, right, you don't understand that. You think that what's causing you to behave this way is what's happening now. It's never what's happening now. You know, the only way you could be upset at all about anything that's happening now is you have to have a reference point, don't you? If something happens in order for you to be upset, right, you have to have some way of understanding it so that it occurs to you to be upsetting. And the only way that could happen is you have to be referencing it to your past experiences, yes? yes. And that's what's happening all the time. And it's happening automatically. And it's happening in such a way that you're so completely identified with it that you don't see it. You don't see it going on, you know? You, you, you believe that the person you're dealing with is the source of your upset. And so you have to control them, you have to get away from them, you have to make them wrong. And since that's not true, all you're doing is stimulating them to react to you. So now you have two people trying to, uh, you know, survive a threat, right? They're both seeing the other person as a threat and they're both trying to survive the threat. And ultimately, if that gets Intense enough, ultimately, somebody gets killed, right? Somebody gets killed. You, you kill off the enemy. You kill off the threat. And in reality, you know, the unfortunate truth is, and in reality, every time somebody kills somebody, they're killing themselves. That's the truth. Because you and everybody else are the same exact being. The awareness that you are ha is not at all in any way different from the awareness that I am or anybody else is. It has no form. My awareness has no form. Your awareness has no form, right? It has no gender. My awareness has no gender. Your awareness has no gender, right? It doesn't occur in time for either one of us, right? It's always there for both of us. It's the same. It's literally and exactly the same, which means that it's like they asked one of the you know, gurus at one point, you know, well, what about other people? You know, in terms, of you're, you're talking about managing your mind and you're managing your emotions and you're practicing this. What about other people? And the answer that the master gave is, there are no other people. When you're awake, if you're, when you're awake and you see things as they are, you're seeing yourself when you look at another human being. And if you really understand these teachings, you see, that's the thing. If you really understand these teachings and you take it all the way, you realize that whatever is going to happen is going to happen. There's no protection. And the more able you are to experience your true nature, the less you're bothered by that. Because your true nature isn't going anywhere. It's not trying to survive. It's not trying to control anything. It's allowing everything to be as it is. The biggest thing you can do if you're under threat, if somebody's threatening you, right, that doesn't know the truth, that believes they're their body and their mind, right? If somebody's threatening you that believes, I used to work in a prison, right? And I, I've dealt with that. I've had somebody threaten my life in the prison right there in real time telling me that they were gonna kill me, okay? And if that happens, the best chance you have of surviving that is to be able to stay calm and relaxed in the face of that situation.
because if you stay calm and relaxed, you can see the possibilities that exist for you to deal with it that you can't see if you're upset and your attention narrows down like it does when you feel threatened and you're afraid. I had that happen several times when I was in the prison. By an in, in one time it happened when a, an inmate who, this guy weighed about 260 pounds and he wasn't fat. And he, and he was about six feet seven tall. Right? And I walked into an cl enclosed area and he came in behind me. He was uh, one of the, my clients there and he uh, had a serious mental disorder and he was psychotic. And he walked in behind me and started crying and telling me that, that I was the reason why he was so upset. And he was in prison already, right, for, for his behavior, right? Now, naturally, I'm no different than you. When that happened, I had a thrill of fear come up in me. Like, you know, this is like, and there was no help in sight, right? But I was able, right, to recognize the fear and to stay aware of the situation, to stay present to the situation, right, such that, I started to talk to him and get him, got him to interact with me, right? Even though he was escalating, right? But as he's talking to me and interacting with me, I'm moving around so that I'm closer to the door than he is. And then I just stepped out of the door and took off. Next time I saw that inmate, he was in, uh, he was in uh, uh, isolation for, for psychiatric isolation, right? And he had put, his, he had stood up, uh, got himself all wet, and put his finger in the light socket. Uh, hmm. So when you're dealing with people like that, right, you had better be able to remain calm in the face of your own fear. And see, the thing is this, that's an extreme situation, okay? But what I'm, what I'm telling you is meditation, if you practice it consistently and you are able to calm the mind and relax the body and you do establish a baseline like that, you know, a ground of being like that, right? Then in your life and the situations that you encounter other people where things start to get crazy, people start to get upset, right? You can remain calm enough and present enough to see how to deal with it in a way that it doesn't go bad. You can see a way out. It, thinking isn't the problem. It's identifying with thinking that's the problem. Thinking isn't a problem. If you identify with thinking and you think that you're doing the thinking, you're the thinker of the thoughts, right? Then you're responsible for how crazy you are. <laughs> right? That's the way it is for most people. Most people consider themselves to be the thinker of their thoughts. And so they, therefore they know they're crazy and they have to go around hiding it. You know, you know just as well as I do. If you, if you told people that you were around exactly what you were thinking all the time, they'd stay away from you. And they should stay away from you because thinking is crazy. Your thoughts are crazy. The, thing, the things you think about are crazy. But thinking itself is not a problem. Thinking is very useful. The mind itself is not a problem. The mind is very useful. If it's being used by you instead of using you, for most people, they're 100% identified with their mind, and therefore, the mind is using their life to express itself. The mind is using your life to run a program and play that program out. And the program the mind is playing is survival, and the way it survives is by being right all the time and making anybody else wrong, right? That's surviving as a point of view, isn't it? Yeah, making people wrong, being right all the time, being in control all the time avoiding discomfort, seeking satisfaction, anything that's too inconvenient you avoid. The mind is in, in, interested in survival and being comfortable. And so that will determine the way you live your life. Not peace, well-being, satisfaction, contentment, not that. That well-being is not available when you're in a state of mind. A state of mind is unreal. A state of mind is unreal. The, the, the personality is unreal. It cannot experience well-being. When you move attention from the thinking activity to being aware of the body breathing, as soon as you leave thinking, 
you're experiencing your true nature. As soon as you leave the thinking activity, you're experiencing your true nature. When you think, you go right back into being the person. Yeah. So then it's what you think about meditation instead of the truth. That's why we're practicing moving attention away from the thinking activity so you can begin to experience the natural way of being, the natural state, a state of being, not a state of mind. That's what we're interested in, a state of being, not a state of mind. And that state of being is comfort and, and feeling good. Naturally. Naturally. State of being is a state of relaxation, it's a state of calmness, it's a state of clarity, it's a state of fulfillment, it's a state of contentment, it's a state of peace. And we mimic it when we practice meditation because peace is equal to silence and stillness, is it not? <coughs> peace is equal to silence and stillness. That's why we're practicing, not moving and being silent. We're, we're imitating the experience of our true nature when we practice meditation. We're imitating it, but when we're imitating it, we start to actually bring it into view. We start to actually bring it into existence, or it seems like we're bringing it into existence. It's already in existence, and what we're doing is bringing out of existence what isn't real. We're bringing out of existence the personality, and when it's out of existence, what's there is the natural state, the awareness. That's why I keep saying, don't try and meditate. Meditation is the experience of being, and you're already, that's already occurring. Very important to understand that, you're already there. I was talking to one of my students today in a Zoom conference, and he was kind of checking in with me to see, you know, how, how I, what I thought about where he was in his process. So I listened to him describe it, you know, and he was describing how he feels that he's making progress, and you know, and he's feeling more peace and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And when he was done, I said, okay, you want to, do you want the feedback on that? And he said, yeah. I said, you're still there. You're still there. The only direct and honest feedback I can give anybody about this is to say, you're there. You're there. No matter what you think, no matter how you feel, no matter what you got figured out, you're there. That's where you want to focus your attention, is on the idea that you're experiencing your true nature all the time, right? So it's not like you're going to. No, you are experiencing your true nature all the time. Even when you're being the personality, you're experiencing your true nature, because the personality is your true nature, but it's the forgotten aspect of it. It's the forgotten aspect of it. So it seems like it's not it, but it is it. All right.